this week on the Bioneers, Revolution from the Heart of Nature. How do you harness this capitalist engine to create a more broadly shared prosperity? I'm Neil Harvey. Author Stephen Hill has found models of sustainable prosperity in Europe. Join us for Social Capitalism and the United States of Europe this week on the Bioneers, Revolution from the Heart of Nature. Europe was a place that had fought wars for centuries. These were countries that had plowed their resources, their wealth into becoming military warring machines, which should sound familiar to Americans. And it didn't work out very well. After they fought two world wars, interestingly, it was the conservative politicians of Europe, people like Conrad Adenauer from Germany, Winston Churchill from Britain, that said, you know, we can't do this anymore. This is totally destructive to our our well-being, and we've got to come up with another way. And that's where they began crafting this social capitalism. To describe the original vision of the European Union, the global financier and public intellectual George Soros invoked the idea of a fantastic object. A fantastic object signifies an unreal but attractive object of desire. Soros wrote that the original vision for the EU was for an open society, a, quote, association of nations founded on the principles of democracy, human rights, and the rule of law that is not dominated by any one nation or nationality. Its creation was a feat of piecemeal social engineering led by a group of far-sighted statesmen who understood that the fantastic object was not within their reach. They set limited objectives and firm timelines and then mobilized the political will for a small step forward, knowing full well that when they accomplished it, its inadequacy would become apparent and require a further step." Unquote. The first small step forward was to create the euro as a common currency. The euro made Europe a global economic power. Europe watcher Stephen Hill calls the EU model social capitalism. It's a new economic species of capitalism that shares prosperity more widely, institutionalizes broader national democracy, and is designed to create long-term environmental sustainability. Hill contends it may be the most important innovation in the world economy since the rise of the corporation as the greatest wealth generator in history. Hill believes the severe shocks from the 2008 global economic and banking crisis are now forcing the EU to take the next bold steps toward a United States of Europe. He says we have a ringside seat to history, and the whole world is watching. This is a fantastic object, social capitalism and the United States of Europe, with author and political observer Stephen Hill. My name is Neil Harvey. I'll be your host. Welcome to the Bioneers, revolution from the heart of nature. The 27-nation European Union is collectively the world's largest economy, producing over a quarter of global GDP. It's almost as big as the U.S. and Canadian economies combined, and nearly three times the size of China's. The EU has more Fortune 500 companies than the U.S. and China together, and is now the largest trading partner with both the U.S. and China. European social capitalism includes universal health care that's affordable, education for all that's often free, family-friendly work policies, and real worker participation in corporate and workplace decision-making. The question is, will these innovative social and economic policies withstand the aftershocks of the Europe-wide recession from the 2008 global banking crisis? Stephen Hill is a California-based writer, lecturer, and political professional, a frequent speaker at academic, government, NGO, and business events. He's the author of five books, including Europe's Promise, Why the European Way is the Best Hope in an Insecure Age. Ironically, the unique EU social capitalism model arose in Germany following World War II. Led by the U.S., the Allies were intent on breaking up the concentrated wealth and power of the big German corporations and business elites that had fueled the Nazi regime. Stephen Hill spoke with us at a recent Bioneers conference. Social capitalism, do I mean, you still have, it's still capitalism. You have private companies who are trying to produce wealth and profits, but they have regulations that have been put around these corporations and businesses. 
And small businesses in, in Europe produce two-thirds of the jobs compared to only about half the jobs in the United States. So they have a very vibrant small business sector as well as corporations. They have both. And so the idea was how do you harness this capitalist engine to create a more broadly shared prosperity? And once they decided to do that, then they said, well, what do we do with this wealth if we're going to make it more broadly shared? Do you just have everyone make more income? And they said, no, it makes more sense. So let's think about what are the things that people need in their lives. They need things like health care, retirement pensions, child care. These are the things that people need, training, uh, university education, in order to participate and enjoy the fruits of the economy. Stephen Hill paints a stark contrast between Europe's social capitalism and the Wall Street trickle-down model of concentrated wealth and power. So what does this fantastic object look like on the ground? European countries, especially those in Western Europe, have far more than most Americans can even imagine. They have you know, universal health care that's affordable. They have more generous retirement pensions. They have uh, university education. In some countries, it's still free. And in others, you know, it's a few hundred dollars. I mean, in the United States, American students graduate tens of thousands of dollars in debt. They have child care that's at least six times less expensive. Some countries in Europe, the child care costs no more than what you just pay into the taxes. They have kitty stipends for families of all economic levels. When you have a child that's born, you get a certain amount of money per month, two to three hundred dollars to pay for the things you need for your, your newborn. You know, they have more vacation. They've been able to do all this in a way that's much more ecologically sustainable. The average European uses half the electricity and emits half the carbon of the average American, even though they have a, a standard of living that's at least as good and, and in some ways better than ours. Um, their ecological footprint, as it's been called, is half of that in the United States. So in many, many ways, the European way of life, the European way, as I call it, is, is really leading the 21st century. In fact, European countries, not the U.S., have provided the most innovative, pragmatic models for economic and environmental sustainability. Closely watching are countries such as China, India, Brazil, and Australia. Take health care. Americans are paying twice as much money per capita for health care than they're paying in France or in, in, in Germany or Sweden. And all the indicators show that we're getting worse health. So we're paying twice as much money for worse health. Why? Because we have this decentralized, hodgepodge, for-profit system, whereas in Europe they've created not really a centralized system. For example, Germany, the backbone of the healthcare system is 200 private insurance companies, private insurance companies, not government-owned, but they're all nonprofits, and they also negotiate fees and services every year about how much doctors can charge for the services they provide. You can go into a French doctor's office and you can ask for the menu and you can see how much they charge you for every service they do. A system of nonprofit health insurance companies is one example of a basic structural change that provides benefits for all. Since its inception, European social capitalism has sought a fundamental rebalancing of the interests of private enterprise and public goods through structural reforms of the corporation itself. Again, Stephen Hill. In Sweden, and in Germany, many countries in Europe, they, in effect, have reinvented the corporation. For example, in Germany, they have major corporations like we have in the United States, Fortune 500 companies. But in those Fortune 500 companies in Germany, the workers who work in those corporations get to elect 50 percent of the members of the board of directors. Imagine if Walmart were required by law to allow its workers to elect 50 percent of the members of the board of directors and how that would affect how Walmart acts towards not only employees but the communities in which they reside. And yet most Americans, even progressives on the left side of the political spectrum, haven't even heard of this. I mean, this is a major economy. Germany is the fourth largest economy in the world, the world's largest exporter. These are Fortune 500 companies with you know Volkswagen, Mercedes, Siemens – where the workers get to elect 50 percent of the board members. It hasn't made their companies less competitive. It hasn't hurt Germany's economy. In fact, Germany's economy is doing way better than the American economy right now. They have 6 percent unemployment. They have emerged from this economic collapse in rather good shape for lots of reasons because of the policies they've pursued. You know, and yet these are things that Americans aren't even aware of. I mean, what Germany did, instead of laying off millions of German workers, they had everyone cut back a little bit. So if you were working 100 percent full time, you're maybe now working 90 or 85 percent full time. But during the good years, the German government was putting money away to make up the wages that you would lose by cutting back. 
Now, what that did was a couple of other good things. One, it kept more money in more people's pockets, so consumer spending didn't collapse like it did in the United States, and that in turn gives customers to businesses so they don't have to feel like they have to keep laying people off. It also means that the utter devastation that happens to communities when the main breadwinners are laid off. And you can see it in the United States, communities like Stockton, California, where you know entire neighborhoods are in foreclosure, increases in domestic violence, mental illness, alcoholism, all the sorts of things that happen when you start laying people off from work. That could have been avoided. It was avoided in places like Germany. You also keep your workforce intact. So when the recovery comes, your workforce is there, their skill level is there. You don't have people like you have now in the United States who have been out of work for a year, year and a half, two years, who've lost their skills, their sharpness, their productivity. And yet when Larry Summers was asked, look, this German thing, it seems to have worked out pretty well. It's called short work, Kurzarbeit. Why don't we try that? He said, well, in America, we're not about protecting old jobs. We're about creating new jobs. As if there's some contradiction between the two. Why can't you do both? So when it came to bailing out big banks, suddenly they suspend their fundamentalism. But when it came to helping out Main Street, people losing their homes, losing their jobs, at that point, suddenly the economic fundamentalism kicks in. So this is an attitude that just has to be challenged everywhere. And I I think more of it is being challenged. Occupy Wall Street, even the Tea Party movement to some degree, represents a populist challenging of this economic elitism that has led to this Wall Street capitalism trickle-down economy. When we return, how the fantastic object of the European Union's social capitalism is innovating on taxes, environmental sustainability, and democracy, and what it could mean for the United States. This is a fantastic object, social capitalism and the United States of Europe. I'm Neil Harvey. You're listening to The Bioneers, revolution from the heart of nature. Bioneers Revolution from the Heart of Nature is made possible in part by John Masters Organics. Feel good about looking good. Learn more at johnmasters.com. Free distribution of this program is made possible in part by support from listeners like you. To explore more Bioneers radio shows and conference videos for free, visit bioneers.org. European social capitalism delivers affordable universal health care, education, child care, and other public goods. But U.S. economic fundamentalists attack the European model because they say it requires the bugaboo of high taxes. Stephen Hill urges a closer look. I mean, one of the things you hear about the European system is that Europeans pay a lot more in taxes than Americans. And this is another myth because Europeans get a lot more in exchange for those taxes that Americans have to pay for out of pocket. So, for example, if you're an American paying for health care and you're paying high premiums, the Anthem Blue Cross just announcing an increase of up to 40 percent in health care premiums, you're paying higher deductibles, that's all coming out of pocket. If you're paying more for child care, if you're graduating tens of thousands of dollars of debt with a university degree and you have to pay that back, that's all coming out of pocket. And yet when they start figuring out who pays more in taxes, they don't even look at these sorts of things. It's kind of remarkable, really, to think of how bad, with all the economists out there and all the, the, the money that's spent on research, that the analysis is so shoddy that they don't even look at what you're paying out of pocket to get what Europeans are getting in exchange for their taxes. Hill points out that the tax criticism is largely a smokescreen designed to protect highly profitable U.S. industries and the wealthiest Americans. According to the IRS, in the 15 years before the Great Recession of 2008, the 400 wealthiest Americans saw their incomes rise by 392 percent, while their average tax rate fell by nearly 40 percent. The wealth of the top 400 became greater than that of the bottom 150 million Americans combined. Nor has this trickle-down economy benefited the 46 million Americans living under the poverty line by 2010. The 15% poverty rate is the highest since before President Lyndon Johnson's famous war on poverty in the 1960s. 
Hill says it's not just an issue of extreme inequality, but of good macroeconomic sense. Without consumers to buy goods and services, the economy will keep spiraling downward in a tailspin. The economic fundamentalists make the same kind of arguments against investing in environmental sustainability, that it will harm the economy. Stephen Hill says that's just another smokescreen. Europe is just doing so much more than the United States when it comes to sustainability and making their businesses sustainable, making their economy green, and in the process creating green jobs. And they've created hundreds of thousands of green jobs across the EU. And as a result of this, you see that Europeans are emitting half the carbon using half the electricity. It takes 40 percent more fuel to go a mile in an American car than it does in a European car or a Japanese car. They're doing it in a whole range of ways. I mean, you have, for example, the low wattage light bulbs, uh, the CFLs, where they take a fifth of the power now to create the same luminosity. You see those throughout Europe. In fact, they passed a directive that, you know, the companies and households had time to implement them. But now at this point, they, you can't get an incandescent bulb in Europe. Motion sensors in rooms so that when no one's in the room, the lights go off. They're doing things like green building design that are way beyond lead checkoff system that we have here that really just is not very efficient in certain ways. I mean, they are rethinking buildings. They're making buildings where, for example, the buildings are hermetically sealed and air inside can't get out unless you let it. And as you let the air inside out, it can hand off the heat, if you will, in the building to the air coming in. And so you can heat uh, you know, a household for the amount of electricity it takes to run a hairdryer. They're doing all sorts of things with automobiles, electric cars and such. You know, off the coast of Portugal, they have these things called sea snakes. They're these huge tubes about 300 feet long and about 25 feet in diameter, and they can hook them together, and there's a piston inside, and they put them on the ocean. And, uh, and as the waves go up and down, the, the wave motion creates energy 24-7. And so off the coast of Portugal, they have these sea snakes that are providing electricity to coastal villages that are kind of isolated and hard to run electric lines to. There's just so many things like this that they're doing as they really try to not just change the light bulbs, but really rethink how do we make a modern economy green. While reinventing the corporation, the European model of social capitalism has also been reinventing democracy at the national level. The other area where Europe has really outshined us here in America is in the development of their democracies, uh, representative democracies, at the national level. At the EU level, their institutions are still in the process of development. But at the national level, they have developed better forms of democracy than we have here, including things like proportional representation, which creates multi-party democracy, public financing of campaigns, free media time, universal or what I sometimes call automatic voter registration. Everyone is registered to vote, not uh, you know tied to each election as I try to keep my people on the rolls and get your people off like we have in the United States where it's a very contentious process. They have just a more pluralistic system and because they have these other methods I just described, they have more representative legislatures. You see more women elected in the legislatures, and some countries are 35, up to 40 percent of the legislature, national legislatures, are women. In the United States, we're still stuck at 18 percent. And there's all sorts of research showing that the presence of more women in your legislature has a qualitative as well as quantitative effect in the types of legislation that's introduced and passed, particularly when it comes to things like war, when it comes to things like family supports, all these sorts of things. Having more women in your legislature makes a big difference. And so they have devised methods that really has produced better democracy, more representative democracy, and as a result, the policies that come out of those legislatures reflect more the will of the public. And what we're seeing in the United States right now is a huge disconnect between what the public wants and what the United States Congress produces. And there's lots of reasons for that, things like the filibuster in the Senate, the fact that the Senate is such an unrepresentative body where you only get two senators per state regardless of population, and we don't have any third parties or independent candidates being elected, whereas a country like Germany has five to six parties being elected into their legislature. Two of them are major parties, and then the other three or four parties are smaller parties that bring new ideas to the table. 
The smaller parties in a democracy are extremely important. They are, in some ways, the laboratory for new ideas. They are what allows the conversation to happen between the political center and the political margins that rejuvenate your democracy on a regular basis. We don't have any of that in the United States, but these proportional representation democracies with public financing and such, they have that. In Sweden, Germany, Denmark, you can see 19-year-olds being elected to the national parliament, young people getting elected to the national parliament. What a concept to represent young people and their concerns and issues, and yet you couldn't even imagine that in the American context. So in many ways, the American democracy is quite broken, and, and in order to fix the economic problems that we've spent a lot of time talking about, we are going to have to fix some of these political democratic problems as well in order to get to those economic problems because right now the economic system has basically captured the political system and it's not just a matter of too much money in our elections it's i wish that was it was that simple it's because we don't have things like proportional representation you know free media time for candidates automatic voter registration and lots of other little side features that you see in Europe that help to promote democracy, things like question time in the House of Commons in, in the UK. They have that in Sweden and others where the party leaders debate once a week the issues in a very dramatic uh, fashion. There's just so many things they're doing there that are quite interesting that we could learn from. These kinds of democratic models operate at the national level throughout Europe, but not for the European Union itself, where there are legitimate and acute issues of undemocratic governance structures yet to be resolved. Stephen Hill contends that the current European economic crisis can be a positive force because it's compelling Europe to confront the next necessary steps its founders foresaw to decide if it's going to become the U.S. of E. For instance, will the EU agree to become a true fiscal union with coordinated budget management and central lending? Will it become a transfer union where better-off members can subsidize worse-off states? After all, Californians get back only 75 cents on every federal dollar they pay, whereas Mississippians and Alabamians get back $2 for every dollar. And will EU politicians be able to gain public support toward full political union? Hill reminds us what it took for the American colonies to become the United States. They're having problems, been having problems after this economic collapse with the Eurozone and coming up with a, a currency. And, you know, th there's a lot of headlines about that, people saying, oh, the decline and fall on Europe, as Time magazine has said. But in fact, what we're seeing there is exactly the opposite, that Europe is figuring out how united it wants to be. And in the United States, we went through that soul-searching over 200 years ago. And you can see in the United States, it took about 80 years for this collection of regions to cease being just a collection of regions to be really a united country. And in fact, it took a civil war that people think of the Civil War in the United States was fought over slavery, which it was in part, but it was also fought over states' rights. Eighty years after the foundation of the United States, they were still fighting over states' rights versus a federal centralized government. So these are very complex issues. When you start talking about should German taxpayers bail out the Greeks, should California taxpayers bail out Alabama, Mississippi, Texas, the fact is the United States, the blue states, as we call them, have been bailing out the red states for years, even as the red states, which are the more conservative states, saying, we hate government, get government off our back. Stephen Hill believes that the EU social capitalism model will pull through its current challenges. But no matter what happens, he's convinced the genie is out of the bottle, and people in the U.S. and around the world can adopt the learning and advances that have already crystallized. People need to fasten their seatbelts. It's going to be a, a rough ride and really start pushing on these issues in a way and educating ourselves about things like co-determination, worker-elected boards of directors of major corporations. It just takes a member of Congress to introduce a bill. It just takes a member of Congress to introduce a bill for nonprofit health care. Forget the single-payer argument. It's a zero-sum game there argument. There are other methods out there that in many ways are better than single-payer, and other countries are doing them. Introducing bills for short work. You know, even now, with over 9 percent unemployment, we could still have some people cut back a little bit at their job and take the people who are unemployed and have them fill the time that's created by having people cut back a little bit because of short work. So there are policies we could be pursuing right now. We can pursue them in five years. We can pursue them in 10 years. We just need more people, more Americans, to understand that there are options out there. And, you know, we're no longer the best. We don't have to be afraid to learn from other countries, other places, 
that are doing things better than we are. So I'm relatively optimistic that the world is moving forward. If you think of the trajectory of the world historically, it's been towards greater rights for women, for minorities, creating systems like health care, pensions that help us to lead a better life. And now other countries like China, India, Brazil are saying, you know what, we want in on that. And they deserve to be in on that. So the world is in a process of rebalancing and finding a new equilibrium, but it's going to take decades. And, and we just need to keep pushing on this in a way that, you know, in 2050, the world is going to look much different. And I think in many ways much better than it does right now. Stephen Hill, a fantastic object, social capitalism, and the United States of Europe. You can listen to a variety of Bioneers radio shows and view conference videos online at Bioneers.org, where you can also learn about attending the National Bioneers Conference or a local Bioneers Conference near you. The Bioneers Revolution from the Heart of Nature is a production of Collective Heritage Institute. Executive producer, Kenny Ausubel. Written by Catherine Stifter and Kenny Ausubel. Senior producer, Neil Harvey. Managing producer, Stephanie Welch. Production management, Aaron Leventman and Nicole Spangenberg. Interview recording engineer, Jeff Westman. Our theme music is taken from the album Journey Between by Baca Beyond and used by permission of Hannibal Records, a Rykodisc label. Additional music was made available by Acoustic Music Records at acoustic-music.de. For more music information, please visit Bioneers.org. The opinions expressed in the Bioneers Revolution from the Heart of Nature radio series are those of the presenters and are not necessarily those of Collective Heritage Institute, the underwriters, or this radio station. My name is Neil Harvey. Thank you for listening. I invite you to join the Bioneers in inspiring a shift to live on Earth in ways that honor the web of life, each other, and future generations. This is program number 1312. This series is made possible by Organic Valley Family of Farms, organic and family-owned since 1988. Learn more at organicvalley.coop. And by Park Foundation, dedicated to heightening public awareness of critical issues. For more information, visit www.bioneers.org or call 1-877-BIONEER.